Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and in this episode, I'll be speaking with best-selling author and futurist speaker, Nikola Danilov. Nikola writes about the future at his website, Singularity Weblog, and hosts the Singularity FM podcast. His 2017 book, Conversations with the Future, features highlights from his interviews with some of the field's most noteworthy individuals, including Ray Kurzweil, Kevin Kelly, Werner Vinci, and more. We discuss the importance of ethics and the influence of Socrates in Nikola's work, as well as his path from serving in the Bulgarian Armed Forces to studying drone warfare in North America, and how that ultimately led to his fascination with the technological singularity. Once again, we remind you that the thoughts of the guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Future Grind or myself, and as always, show notes and more are available at futuregrind.org. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. This is Future Grind. All right, so now we're here with Nicola. Nicola, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you are an author and a blogger, a podcast and video host, and a futurist speaker. So you have a lot going on. How do you introduce yourself, and how do you describe what it is that you do? <laughs> well, that depends on uh, which hat I'm wearing in that particular moment. But if I am sort of in a sort of a geeky or nerdy sort of, a, sort of techno environment, I could say that I'm a blogger and podcaster on uh, the technological singularity, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and the future of humanity. If I am in an event context, I can say that I'm a best-selling author and a keynote speaker. And if I'm in a sort of a more philosophical context, I could simply say that I'm a simple philosopher interested in basic ethics. You have so much content out there right now, whether it's blog posts or podcast episodes. So if someone in my audience is new to your work, are there a few specific episodes or posts that you would recommend they start with? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, some time ago, I did put a start page for new visitors. So if you go to my homepage, which is uh, singularity.info, you would see in the nav bar a bunch of buttons, and one of them says start new visitors. And uh, you would see a bunch of topics there. Uh, for example, it starts with a technological singularity because this was the original topic that got me going on my journey. And on that topic, you would see six or seven uh, articles or interviews that I recommend my audience starts with. Then I have artificial intelligence, transhumanism, cyborg, life extension, cryonics, synthetic biology, mind uploading, 3D printing, nanotech, religion, death, Bitcoin, and so on. Generally speaking, if you just want to get the gist or the starting base point that I'm starting from, you have to get one distinction. And that's the fact that neither my blog nor my podcast are actually about technology. Technology is just a context, but the topic is actually ethics because technology is amoral. But how we apply technology can be either moral or immoral. In other words, technology is just the tool. And we, as the decision makers, make it a positive or a negative thing because we provide that ethical charge, which technology doesn't have on its own. And therefore, my blog and my podcast are actually not about technology. They're about ethics. They're about those choices we make. And there's a couple of very short, probably three to four minute blog articles on that topic that I have written. One is called Technology is Not Enough. And uh, the other one is called Technology is the How not the why or the what. Well, I will make sure to link to both of those blog posts and your Get Started page in the show notes at futuregrind.org. And I agree with you. A lot of the topics that we discuss here on Future Grind as well go beyond technology itself and focus on the ethical, philosophical, and societal ramifications of this. And I really think that's where the conversation needs to be. So I appreciate that you are tackling it from that angle. 
And you mentioned the technological singularity there, which is the focus of your blog and podcast. So first, how did you become introduced to and interested in the concept of the technological singularity? And secondly, there are many different definitions of singularity. In fact, you describe 15 of them in part one of your book. So when you use that word, what are you referring to? Basically, the way I discovered the technological singularity was when I was probably, what's now, 2018, so that would have been 12 years ago, I was doing a master's degree in political science in York University here in Toronto, Canada. And uh, I was looking for a new topic that's, uh, you know, something different from World War I or World War II that have been beaten to death to write my thesis on. And one day as I turned on the news, it would have been probably late 2005, early 2006 or so, uh, there was this report about drones being used in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. And then I thought, well, why don't I write my thesis on drone warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan? It's a new topic. Nobody's written on it yet. There's no literature or hardly any public awareness of what's going on on that topic. And so I started doing research on uh, drone warfare. And as a result of that, I wrote uh, a paper called, uh, uh, <laughs> that was 12 years ago, my thesis. It was called uh, Hacking Destiny, Critical Security at the Intersection of Machine and Human Intelligence, where I argued that the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan may not be the clash of civilizations, but rather the first time where increasingly automated decisions are taken by increasingly automated machines as per whether a human being would live or die. And so in the process of doing research for that thesis, I discovered first the work of uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, with his phenomenal book called The Singularity is Near, a, a book of nonfiction. And then as luck would have it, Right after I read Ray's book, I read another science fiction novel, which is called Accelerando, and it's by Charlie Strauss. And those two, each one of those books blew my mind completely, but put them together and I went totally scrambled eggs. So uh, it had tremendous impact on the way I perceived the world and the way, you know, I started prioritizing what I do and what I'm interested in and, and how everything around us is going to change. And so I think in 2008, 2009, I graduated from my master's degree and it was the peak of the recession. And after sending probably 300 resumes or so, I only had one interview. And apparently that one interview didn't go very well because they never called me back. But one of those applications that I sent Actually, I sent more than 300, but I stopped counting after 300. <laughs> so anyway, one of them was to, at what was at the time, the biggest uh, singularity blog on the web. And I thought, look, I'm perfect for these guys. I'm a good writer, or so they say. I did research on this topic, which is pretty obscure and nerdy still, for two years. And they'd be very happy to have me. <laughs> but as it turned out, they never responded to me, just like everybody else. Finally, I got the clue that they're not calling me either. But then something really strange happened. I got this idea in my mind that maybe, just maybe, I didn't need them. Maybe I could do it on my own. And so I thought, how hard could it be to start a blog, right? Mind you, this was about 2008, 2009. And while it was easy, it was much, much, much harder than it is today, by the way. But one thing led to another. First, I started a website called singularitysymposium.com. Then I started singularityweblog.com. Eventually, I started Singularity One on One, which was my podcast, which was then rebranded to singularity.fm. And here we are today talking to you. <laughs> you touched upon quite a bit there, and I'm sure we're going to dive into a lot of that further. But one of the questions I have is, you mentioned that you sent out over 300 resumes. And one of those was to Singularity Hub as a writer position. But what were the other 300 jobs that you had applied to? Were they in the media fields or what idea did you have for yourself and your career? Oh, no, none of them were in the media fields. You see, my degree, my undergraduate degree was philosophy, political science and economics or PPE, as we call it. And then my master's was in political science with focus on armed conflict. So actually, most of probably the first 100 or 150 
positions were basically either an analyst of some kind or some kind of government position for Canada's foreign service or any kind of such bureaucratic positions. But in the end, I got so desperate that I was sending out resumes for like anything that I could find a job for. So I sent even for, you know, car salesmen and, and anything to car dealerships and every every kind of job that I could see in the end, I sent an application to. <laughs> So let's find out more about your background. I'm sure my audience will be able to pick out your Bulgarian accent and want to know more about that. So where did you grow up and what was your professional and educational background and how did you eventually come to North America? Yeah, well, I don't know if they can pick up my Bulgarian accent. They can surely pick up my accent. I don't know if they can pick up it's Bulgarian, but it is Bulgarian. Um, see, I was born in uh, Bulgaria in 1976 uh, at the sort of height of the Cold War. So I grew up behind the Iron Curtain in communist Bulgaria until I was 14 when uh, sort of big changes, politically speaking, started happening and uh, communism basically collapsed. Then I graduated from the English language high school in my town Plovdiv, which is the second largest uh, city in Bulgaria and was probably the best high school in the country at the time and got conscripted for my mandatory uh, military service. So I served one year, one month and 26 days. Afterwards, I basically had an honorable discharge. I think I was about 19 or so. And uh, my first job was working at the reception desk of the first private hotel in my town. At the time, not too many people spoke Bulgarian. So, uh, I mean, spoke English, I mean. <laughs> so that, that skill came pretty handy. And then a couple of years later, I applied to a bunch of uh, international universities in the United States, New Zealand, and so on. Uh, with a test called TOEFL, Test of English as a Foreign Language, as well as my high school record. And I got accepted to maybe eight or nine across the world, but I didn't have any money to pay for any of them pretty much. And the cheapest one I got accepted to was in a tiny little place uh, called Beckley, West Virginia. And the reason why that was the only one I could afford to pay for was because I had a little inheritance uh, property that I could sell. And that was probably worth, I think, about $3,000 at the time. And the College of West Virginia was non-discriminating uh, with respect to students, whether they're in-state, out-of-state, or even foreign students. In other words, everyone paid the same fees, which was maybe $1,000 or $1,200 per semester. And then living expenses in uh, Beckley, West Virginia, were super cheap. Like you could buy a house at the time for $30,000. And I was paying rent probably. Actually, we were sharing the second floor of a house with a friend of mine for $200 a month. And my share of that was 100 bucks a month. So that was my rent. <laughs> so I spent a year in the United States basically studying and traveling all over the East Coast. I covered everything from uh, Key West to New York City. And uh, after that year, I decided to come to Canada and move to the University of Toronto, which is uh, where I eventually completed my undergraduate degree. And, uh, uh, you know, after I did my master's, um, I eventually became Canadian citizen and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting story that got you to the point where you're at now. And when you mentioned you started this whole blogging because you did not get the position at Singularity Hub, was your goal to make this a career at this point or was it simply a hobby? When did it become a full-time thing for you and how did you monetize it so that you could support yourself? Well, so at the time, basically, I, I was kind of getting pretty depressed and desperate. As I said, I was sending out uh, job applications for car salesmen, and, and those guys weren't even calling. <laughs> so uh, that's not very kind of uh, hopeful news. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, as the, as the old saying goes, right? So... That actually turned out in retrospect to be very good news to me because, you know, I don't think I would have done very well as a bureaucrat somewhere in the Canadian government or bureaucracy or what have you. Basically, in the beginning, it started out just as a as a sort of give it a try kind of thing. I mean, I was very scared, to be honest, right? 
here I was a political science and philosophy student who had no idea about websites, web design, HTML, or nothing of technical value whatsoever. And I was starting my own blog. And as I said, it wasn't impossibly hard, but it was much harder than it is today back then. And so I was really scared that I lacked the knowledge, I lacked the skills, and I would fail. But then I thought my, I told myself, so what if you fail, right? It's not the end of the world. You're young, you can fail. It's fine. It's okay. Give it a try. So I started the website uh, originally called SingularitySymposium.com, which was an HTML website. And I was horrendous at it. It took me like three months to learn as much HTML just to put my homepage. It was just horrible. In about six months, I think I had about 80 or 90 articles published. But, you know, HTML is very kind of clunky and, and slow and hard way to do it. At least it was to me. And then when I discovered WordPress, I was like, wow, this is incredible. If you can actually type in a word processor, you can actually start blogging via WordPress. It's so much better than HTML. And so then I launched Singularity Weblog, which was about six months after Singularity Symposium. I started doing that for a while. And then six months later, I discovered this thing called podcasting. And, you know, it's one thing to start writing stuff, but it's completely another thing to start using your voice and recording yourself, which, you know, started playing on all my insecurities, like the fact that, as you said, I have a strong Bulgarian accent and all those things. So I thought, first, people would prejudge me and refuse to listen to me because they would say, this guy can't even speak proper English. Why should we listen to him, right? And second, at the time, I didn't feel like I was an expert, even though I already had spent three or four years studying the topic, but I still felt pretty sort of insecure and pretty sort of uh, as a fake, if you will. Like my voice wasn't like the radio voice. I had a strong accent. I didn't feel like an expert. So <laughs> under all rational uh, you know, analysis, I should have never started podcasting. And yet I did. And uh, the idea, let alone the blasphemy, that one day I would be even on camera was utterly ridiculous, <laughs> totally impossible for me to even consider. Uh, but one thing after another, slowly and slowly, my audience size started growing up. And uh, after a few years, I had already interviewed, let's say, the top 100 experts in the world. Uh, in the realms of the singularity, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, synthetic biology, and so on. Uh, I ended up going to um, Singularity University on NASA's Ames campus uh, in the summer of 2011. Uh, and even one of my blog audience members bought my plane ticket. <laughs> so those guys accepted me on a full scholarship, which at the time was roughly about $30,000 or so. And one of my audience members told me, you deserve it. I'm going to buy your plane ticket. So he even paid for my plane ticket. And so slowly one thing after another and sort of like with a big struggle, my audience started growing. In terms of monetization, I have to say that uh, it's always been um, a struggle for me. I've never had this big breakthrough moment, neither with traffic nor with money. It's always been slow grinding and just picking one drop at a time or one person at a time. Originally, it started with small little donations from uh, fans that could uh, go to my blog and, and make a direct donation to me via PayPal. And I would make like three or four hundred dollars a month from from people. Then eventually uh, I had a, a fantastic donor from Portland, Oregon. Uh, Richard Sunvo, who basically was paying anywhere between one and three and four or five thousand dollars for me to produce podcast episodes. And that meant uh, traveling across North America with uh, a camera guy and going to a bunch of places like Alcor Cryonics in Scottsdale, Arizona, or New York City to interview people like Michio Kaku and so on and so on. Today, basically, I have about, I think, five and a half million uh, downloads across uh, iTunes and YouTube. And I monetize my content. I probably have over a thousand articles uh, on the blog, about 220, 30 podcast episodes, uh, which is basically more or less the who's who list of the experts in those fields around the world. And I monetize that content in one of two ways. So first is 
everything on my blog is free and I'm committed to keeping it that way, by the way, forever. So I've had many people suggesting, well, why don't you start charging a dollar for an episode or something like that? But, you know, I get so many emails from people from Africa or Southeastern Asia or Latin America who can't pay a dollar for my episode because that's like all the money they have for lunch that day or something. You know, so I'm committed to keeping all my content for free. However, I make money by speaking. So I'm a keynote speaker. I also make money from the sales of my book, uh, Conversations with the Future, which uh, given that uh, my audience have been asking for me to write it for five years, uh, basically became an Amazon bestseller, both in Canada and in the United States in something like three hours or something after I launched it because I had loyal audience already built up to the size that basically can take my book instantaneously to that status because they were waiting for it. And then the third way that I make money today would be either via direct donations, which can be made uh, straight via PayPal, Bitcoin, and Ether on my blog. Or uh, about four days ago, I launched uh, a Patreon uh, account on uh, patreon.com forward slash singularity FM. And, uh, yeah, so those are the ways that, and of course, the Patreon is very new. So I think right now I only have six or seven patrons and uh, they're, they've committed about 40 or $41 a month, you know, which is not insignificant because, and I appreciate that very much because 40 bucks a month, someone would say, well, that's not much, but, you know, over a year, that's $500. And that $500 is a substantial chunk. So I appreciate that very much. Well, I'm glad that you made the decision to take a chance and move forward with the blog. I know it's been a great resource for me and many others, and I think it's important work. And you mentioned Singularity University and your book there, and I'll definitely ask more about those later. But before that, all of your branding has the word singularity in it. When you (laughs) use that word, what are you referring to? Right. That was the second part of the question. So you see, to me... There's two main meanings of the word singularity, and both of them are important. So the basic meaning is basically singularity is the moment when artificial intelligence first catches up and eventually surpasses human intelligence. In other words, when machines become smarter than humans. So that's a singularity. But the other meaning, um, and there's many different schools of thought, which meaning is more important and original and all that stuff. But the other meaning is the so-called event horizon meaning. That's basically the meaning that singularity is the moment when we are unable to model the future anymore because our past stops being a proper predictor of what we are to expect from the next several decades. And I think in a way you could argue that we are either very close to it or maybe already within the singularity. And what I mean by that is this, right now, so let's say 50 or 100 years ago, you could look forward and you could project about how government would look like, how corporations would look like in 20 or 30 years, how the family would look like in 20 or 30 years how international organizations would look like in 20 or 30 years, how society and religion would look like in 20 or 30 years. So there was this kind of a direct line, maybe with upward slope, but still we were able to extrapolate. Now, however, given the exponential curve that we're moving along and the potential that we're actually getting close to the hockey stick a moment where the curve starts going further up and up in a much steeper and sharper curve, then uh, we may not be able to accurately predict what would be, uh, what would happen to the family as a unit in the next 20 or 30 years when we have people potentially living indefinitely. We don't know what will happen to government as the basic unit that rules ourselves. We don't know what will happen to democracy as we know it. We don't know what will happen to corporations. We don't know how religion is going to adapt to it. We don't know how our laws are going to adapt to it. In other words, everything that we think we know, everything around us, everything that makes our human civilization what it is today is up for grabs. It's going to be changed because it's already being seriously challenged. And many of those structures are falling apart or about to fall apart. 
And so in that sense, it is a singularity because it is a point like a black hole beyond whose event horizon we are unable to see anything. And so, uh, yeah, I think in that sense, we are probably already in a singularity because I don't think that anyone can project with any certainty or accuracy from now, even let's say what's going to happen in let's say 2038 or to even 2028. That's a good overview of some of the changes that we can expect in the future. But now let's switch our focus and look at the past. The blogger name that you go by is Socrates, which of <laughs> course is the name of the classical Greek philosopher. Yeah. Why did you decide to use a name other than your own and how did you settle on Socrates? So my specialty in undergrad was ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and I always had a very soft spot for Socratic uh, philosophy, whether it's Plato, Xenophon, and so on. The ancient Greeks, the Pythagoreans, the Epicureans, Cyrenaics, every one of them. The Stoics, of course, I, I should never forget the Stoics, they're major. And then Seneca from the Romans, Seneca, Lucretius, Cicero and of course Marcus Aurelius. So when I got to blogging, as I said, I was pretty scared. And you know, at the time we still believed that there is such thing as anonymity online. And the joke of the day was that you know nobody knows that you're a dog online. In other words, the the idea, which is kind of naive now when you look back in it at it in retrospective, but the idea was that at the time the internet would make everyone equal and nobody would know who's who and that this kind of free and amazing thing would happen. And so, especially since I didn't know if I'm going to succeed or fail, I thought, well, why don't I start writing with a pseudonym, right? I mean, even if you look at great writers or movie stars, so Marilyn Monroe is not Marilyn Monroe, she's Norma Jean. And Mark Twain is not Mark Twain. All of them picked pseudonym. So I thought, I mean, Mark Twain's name was originally Samuel Clemens. <laughs> so, and my name is Nikola Danilov, and I'm in North America. So I thought, well, how can I pick a pseudonym that's kind of accurate in representing the fact that I don't originate from here, but doesn't quite go all the way to reveal my identity? And so I thought, well, I love Socrates, and many people have also given me the name of Socrates when I was in the army uh, for a number of reasons, like asking questions all the time and stuff like that. So it's not a nickname that I pick per se myself, but it was kind of given to me. And at some point I thought, well, instead of fighting it, why don't I just embrace it? <laughs> so all those things put together and you end up with an alias of Socrates. Well, I think that makes sense, and it gives the audience an idea of what they're getting, because you do come at this from a philosophical perspective, and Socrates, of course, was among the first moral philosophers, and since you focus on ethics, I think that is a great name for you to choose. And I've also heard you mention that you'd like your Singularity weblog to be a modern version of the Greek Symposium. Can you exactly. explain this further? Exactly, yeah, that's the idea. You see... The ancient Greeks, especially in the Socratic time, but even in Rome too, had this idea called symposium. And basically, in colloquial terms, a symposium is a drinking party. You know, it's a very low-key, very relaxed event where people get together and just eat, drink, listen to music, and have good time. However, in addition to that, they would often discuss profoundly important topics such as philosophy, ethics, religion, law, war, love, beauty, poetry, and so on and so on. And the idea is that at the end of the night, after the symposium was over, each guest would leave the party with a new understanding, new awareness of the topic that was discussed. And usually Plato would uh, sort of set the context for those uh, symposia. And Socrates was kind of like the protohost, where he would play the role of the sort of the guide into our investigation of any particular topic by asking very important and relevant and witty questions. And so the idea of Socrates was that he never taught anyone anything, but rather what he did was he acted as a midwife 
to helping other people giving birth to their own ideas. And so I thought that sounds to me like a like a great vocation or a great approach uh, to embrace, and which is why I've tried to kind of cover the whole political spectrum within the technology realm uh, and, and have representation even from religions and, and scientists and philosophers and artists and a diversity of people whose views and opinions I don't necessarily embrace and quite often disagree tremendously with. But the idea is that my opinion is not the right opinion. It's basically an opinion which I use just simply to bounce the, my guests' ideas off. And then I provide hopefully enough space for my audience or my readership to make up their own mind, to choose their own path, to, to, to create their own decisions and hopefully give birth to their own ideas. And if that, that is to happen in, indeed, then that means I have accomplished my goal. One of the more noteworthy and controversial talks that you've given occurred in late 2015 in Rotterdam and was titled The Emperor Has No Clothes. <laughs> in this talk, I'll give a little bit of background here. Uh, you called attention to some potential shortcomings of Singularity University, saying that they were neither about the singularity or a university, and that their business model was to create scarcity to sell abundance. Uh, you contended that SU was not an exponential organization in part because they prioritized expensive in-person trainings that weren't scalable and that they did not democratize access to their videos and other content, and that they have served essentially as a startup incubator. You mentioned that you believe that SU fell short of their stated goal to positively impact 1 billion people within 10 years and to educate, inspire, and empower leaders to apply exponential technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. Uh, first of all, I thought this was a great talk, and I agree with many of your points, and they were criticisms of SU that I have had as well. But I'd love to dive into this further over the next few questions. First, I, I know that you had completed the graduate studies program at Singularity University, like you mentioned earlier. What was that experience in person like for you, and what was your relationship with SU like before this talk? So, uh, the experience is uh, tremendous, and I recommend it to anyone who has the chance to do it. Because basically, you get into the kitchen of Silicon Valley. Too bad that that program is actually no longer being offered. And uh, is <laughs> in many ways, uh, what I predicted in 2015 has come to be true, but I'll come back to that part later. So if anyone could go to Singularity University, I highly recommend it. I was there for two and a half months or 10 weeks. And at that time, we had probably 240 or 50 lectures. Uh, we were going uh, from probably 8.30, 9 in the morning, in some cases until midnight the next day. When we were not lecturing or getting lectures, we were visiting places like Tesla, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Cisco, DNA 2.0, I mean, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Ignition Facility, you name it. Basically, the, the who's who list in Silicon Valley, right? So I, I'd say that's a tremendous once-in-a-lifetime experience that I recommend everybody should see and experience. Now, my relationship with uh, most people at SU was uh, excellent, uh, both throughout that period and all the way up to my <laughs> speech in uh, Rotterdam in 2015, after which uh, uh, it kind of went sour because I went public with it. The two or three things that I would say have unfortunately come through uh, is uh, number one is, as I say, they no longer offer that graduate studies program. Or I think uh, they called it later, they renamed it uh, to Global Solutions pro uh, Program. But either way, it's no longer offered. So now you can only go there as, a, as an executive for a week or two at the most at probably 15 or $20,000 per week or something like that. So that's one. Number two is at the time in 2015, I predicted that the actual, and, and I didn't predict, I kind of speculated actually even because many of the things that I said at the time I had evidence and sources for, but the thing that I went out on a limb and totally had no specific 
concrete evidence at that time, but basically tried to extrapolate uh, the actions, not the words, but the actions that Singularity University was taking as an institution over time and project where that would take them. And my conclusion was that Singularity University is basically a child of Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is about one thing, which is start a business, build it as big and as fast as you can, and then sell it. And uh, just a couple of months ago, Singularity University came public with, so, so they originally started also with uh, the fact that they were a not-for-profit organization. A couple of years after I was there, they switched that to basically being a, a benefit corp, which is a new California status, which is kind of a corp, private corporation, but it has like the tax-free status and some other benefits of a not-for-profit organization. But it is a private organization. It's a private corporation. So they finished a round B of fundraising and they raised $32 million, which in effect is basically selling it or selling parts of it, right? Because when you have an investor in your startup, the investor gives you money and in return you give him shares. So you're selling a part of the of the ownership of that organization. And of course, the organization does it for one purpose only. And usually that in, in Silicon Valley, if you're an angel or a venture capitalist, you're looking for what's called the 10x. So if you put $32 million, you're hoping that in a few years you will take the company public or it would get acquired by another bigger company. Either way, your 32 million would be worth at least 320 million. So, unfortunately, I was correct about that too, that they would be wanting to sell themselves. And one of the buyers was actually Boeing, which I don't think aligns very well with their purported ethical or noble goals. And finally, and ultimately, you can be a good person and you can have noble goals, but once you go along that path and you sell the company, then you basically are beholden to the stockholders and immediately your highest responsibility becomes making money to the investors, right? Regardless of however noble your other goals may be, they become subservient to the main goal, which is making money for the investors. And of course, we all know that the Boeing company is not in business to save the world. In fact, you can argue they have been partially uh, benefiting from the world being destroyed in many places, like, for example, currently in Yemen. And Saudi Arabia is using a lot of Boeing equipment to wage that war over there. And it's one of the greatest humanitarian disasters, currently speaking. So that was kind of a very unfortunate outcome of that acquisition. And the other thing is, take, for example, another company like Facebook, right? And the recent revelations surrounding Cambridge Analytica and the fact that you know, 87 million users of Facebook basically had all their data acquired by Cambridge Analytica. And that's only what we know, by the way, so far. But Mark Zuckerberg is not a bad guy. I actually think he's a very genuine and he's a good guy. I think he's he's a good guy, really. But I think at this moment, at this point of time, he has no control over the company because he has investors and the company is basically public. And the most important thing right now is to make money. And unfortunately, the only way that they make like 97% of their money is by using their users as the product, right? So we are all the product. We are not the users of Facebook. The users of Facebook are those companies like Cambridge Analytica who actually paid money to Facebook to use our data <laughs> or to give access to get access to us in our data and send us certain messages and narratives and manipulate us to buy this product or to vote for this person or what have you. And so many other businessmen have talked about that, by the way. So, for example, Richard Branson talks about this in his book, Losing My Virginity, how when he had Virgin uh, be a public company, he completely lost control over his own baby, basically, over his own company which is why eventually he went back and he bought back every single share and took the company back private so that he has the sole ownership and sole control 
and be in fact the one in charge of his company, right? So this is not, not news. And so by becoming now entangled in this kind of investment obligation with companies like Boeing, Singularity University would at best always be subservient first and foremost to its shareholders. And that's just sad and too bad for me because they had very noble goals and and I think they had good prospects of reaching them too. Yeah, I agree. The team behind Singularity University is amazing and their stated goals are ones that I can absolutely get behind. And you mentioned that you were worried about some of the ramifications of this talk when you gave it. Was there any personal impact to you? And what is your relationship like now with Singularity University or some of the people you had relationships with there? (laughs) Well, look, nothing is free in life. And when you make a decision... Uh, there's always consequences. And so in my case, uh, for example, there were a variety of uh, consequences. Um, One of which, just the least one of which, is that at best I'm currently being ignored, which is totally okay by me, by the way. And and that was a decision taken at some point right after my video uh, came out in Rotterdam. So originally they did try to take down the video. And uh, they called the Netherlands and they talked to the event organizers and asked them to take down the video. But I had already foreseen that. I mean, that's not so hard and I'm supposed to be a futurist. So I had already foreseen that possibility and I had already told the event organizers, please let me deal with the videographer directly so that a few days or weeks from now when somebody calls you on the phone and asks you to take down the video, you can say we have nothing to do with it. So I took possession of that video as soon as my presentation was over and I published it on my own channel. And then so after they saw that they couldn't take down the video from there, then uh, they, someone told me that one person even tried calling Google because basically Google is literally a stone throw away from NASA's Ames campus. You can actually walk, I think it's about 20 or 25 minutes walk if, if I remember to Google's campus from SU's campus. And they asked them to take down my video from YouTube, which, of course, Google refused to do, which is good for them, because that's, of course, censorship. And, of course, my video doesn't have, you know, any explicit material, no violence, no sex, no, no, you know, improper language or anything like that. It's just like a philosophical or, or ethical argument, if, if you ask me, or speech or a presentation. Uh, And then they called me and they sort of started uh, investigating (laughs) what's the kind of uh, possibility of me taking down the video, uh, which they quickly found out that that that's kind of zero. (laughs) And uh, yeah, that surely doesn't help uh, to keep the relationship going very well. So an audience member in that talk in Rotterdam asked you about the potential of you authoring a book, and you answered that it was something that you were considering, but you didn't feel prepared to tackle it at that point. Right. And right. a little over a year later, you released Conversations with the Future, 21 Visions for the 21st Century. Talk a bit about this book and how it came to be, and also what changed in the year since the Rotterdam talk that inspired you to move forward with it. So that that talk in Rotterdam was very hard for me in a bunch of levels. Uh, and afterwards, I had people who were calling me fans and who were telling me, look, you should hire a lawyer because they're going to come after you. Or someone was telling me, you should get a bodyguard because, you know, Peter Diamandis deals with uh, shady Russian billionaires and all kinds of stuff. Who knows what he's going to do? And I know a lot of people were very pissed off. Now, uh m- my audience has been have been asking me for a book for five years at least, as I said. And I've always said no, 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 no. But the reality is whatever it is that you're saying no to, after 10,000 no's, there's usually a, a yes. Uh, <laughs> so after I did that speech, um, you know, I kind of got depressed. It's not a very optimistic or positive speech. You know, it's not something I'm particularly proud of. And it costed me a lot emotionally, financially, by the way, too, and in many other ways. And then I had a number of people asking me still to write the book. 
And so I thought, well, this is a good as, as good a time as I'm ever going to get to sort of look back and sort of aggregate perhaps the best of my podcast to this moment and put it in a book form because many people are telling me, well, I don't want to read or listen to 400 hours of podcasts. <laughs> you know, all, all I want is is a book that I can sort of get the gist of the best and, and move on. Anyway, so I... At some point, I couldn't say no anymore, and and I, I produced the book. <laughs> One more question about that Rotterdam talk, and it was from the Q and A. You had mentioned there that you felt ethically that you should be vegan, but you struggled with it and still consumed meat. You said right. that you and your wife had experimented with veganism, but encountered some health consequences that had to be overcome. Since right. then, it seems that you have successfully adopted a vegan lifestyle, and I am very much where you were in 2015. I don't <laughs> want to cause suffering to any conscious creatures, but I also struggle with the idea of committing to a vegan diet. I'd love to know, how did you go about making that change full-time, and what have the results been? So, let me start backwards. So, the results have been that I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm a cyclist. I've lost about... Actually, I've never tried to lose weight because I le I eat literally like a horse now. Uh, but I've still lost about five or six uh, pounds of fat. Um, I'm stronger than ever. I sleep better. I look younger. My skin looks better. And my face is not puffy anymore like it used to be. Uh, when I was going to get uh, portrait uh, pictures done for my speaking by a professional photographer, the first thing she asked me is, are you vegan? And I was like, yeah, how would you know? And she's like, well, meat and especially dairy eaters have very puffy faces. <laughs> anyway, so um, I also did it the scientific way. So I've been following my blood work every three to six months. Uh, and I've been now vegan for over two years. And slowly and slowly, one step at a time, my blood picture has never looked better than it is right now. It's been honestly the best thing that, that I have ever done for me, for my health, but also for the animals themselves, of course, and for the environment, I believe. Now, how and why did I end up doing it? Well, basically, I felt guilty for, and, and I used to be a very heavy meat eater, by the way, because I grew up in communist Bulgaria where we hardly had any meat. So when I was a child, my mother would buy, you know, chicken, and with one chicken, she would make a soup, she would make uh, potatoes, she would make rice. And the whole family, me, my, my mom and my dad, would eat food from that chicken for three or four days. <laughs> when I came to the United States, 1998, I was amazed to discover that if you go to Walmart at like 6 p.m. or something like that, then the fried chicken is actually on sale for like 99 cents or, or something, a dollar, and it was cheaper than bread. So I started stuffing my face with chicken, like someone who's never seen anything like it before. <laughs> because literally it was, it was not something that I grew up with. And so, you know, after living for 20 years in North America, first in the United States, then in Canada, which are, you know, two of the richest countries in the world, and also very, both very heavy meat eaters, lots of beef, you know, I became eventually very heavy meat eater. So I would start my day with, you know, three or four eggs with three or four pieces of bacon, for example. My in-laws are Italian-Americans. And when my mother-in-law cooks dinner, she or lunch when we're doing barbecue in the summer, she wouldn't put like, and she has a very big family, like all Italian family. So it's like 12, 13, 15 people on the table usually. But she wouldn't put like 12 or 13 steaks she would put 16 or 17 steaks or burgers, right? She would put more than the people. And then, of course, my wife would eat half a steak, my sister-in-law half a steak, my other sister-in-law half a steak, and then me and my brother-in-law, we end up eating like three steaks <laughs> in the end. And, you know, that was fine with me. And then I go on the bike the next day and I wonder why I can't make it up the hill. And I want to throw up everything I got. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, uh, I started 
experimenting with all kinds of different things. I went through the paleo for a month. You know, I've interviewed Dave Osprey on my podcast and stuff like that, who is a total bullshitter, by the way, and a salesman. Um, but anyway, um, there's an ancient saying which says that if you know but you don't do, that means you don't know. So there comes a point when you have accumulated so much knowledge that if you don't take any action, it means that you don't know. So I knew enough about the suffering of animals. I knew enough about industrial farming. I knew enough about the fact that, you know, uh, the cattle and the farming industry is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases on our planet. And the only thing that I had to struggle with was the fact that I thought that, you know, the, the usual stereotypes, how am I going to get my iron? How am I going to get my protein? And how am I going to get my calcium? Those were the, the, the basic myths that are all false that, you know, meat eaters are concerned about. And um, it got to a break point where we had this big, about two and a half years ago, we had this big family gathering on Easter. Every year in Easter, my wife, as I said, is Italian-American, so they have a big dinner in Easter. And me and my wife had the big meal just like everybody else. And just like everybody else, we were completely lethargic and comatose after the food was over. And we kind of looked at each other and sort of at the same time we blurted, we are so done with this. <laughs> And so the next day we came back home, I opened up the fridge and everything that I had in my fridge that was non-vegan, like butter, milk, cheese, you know, I'm Bulgarian. So I basically didn't eat a lot of meat, but I used to eat a lot of cheese and dairy, yogurt, milk. I, I used to do tons of that. And I gave everything away to my sister-in-laws and we became vegan. Now, when I say vegan, let me be clear. Vegan is a very, very bad word to use. It's a horrendous word to use because you can be vegan by eating, you know, I don't know, Twinkies and white bread and white pasta and white rice um, and all kinds of other processed junk food and you would probably die in three months and you would be obese and unhappy and unfit and miserable in the meantime. When I say vegan, what I mean actually is whole plant-based food, whole plant-based diet. And, you know, I was 39 years old when I did the switch. That's 39 years of moment, momentum and inertia that we carry with us of how we used to eat and how we're used to used to eat. And then you, you have to understand that you cannot change that overnight without making some mistakes. But if anything is worth doing right, then it's worth doing wrong for a period of time until you figure out how to do it right. And so I started and in the first six months we did many mistakes and we still do many mistakes today because it's a learning process and we constantly tweak it and get better. And so I made all the mistakes. I ate a lot of white bread in the beginning. I ate a lot of white rice. I ate a lot of stuff like that. And in the first six months I gained five pounds. Basically it takes anyway about six months for your microbiome to adjust to the increased amounts of fiber to the fact that you don't put dairy and cheese and meat anymore and, and all that kind of stuff. Because the microbiome is actually one of the most important thing health-wise that you have in your body. And of course, meat eaters have an entirely different microbiome from plant-based people. And so one step at a time, just like with blogging and podcasting, just like with anything else, two years later, every single measure that you can think of in my blood picture uh, and by the way, the longest thing for me to get right uh, was cholesterol, is now normal. But the cholesterol took uh, probably 18 months. So my iron went up, my B12 went up, my inflammation level basically disappeared. I feel better. People who haven't seen me in 10 years say that I look better now than I looked 10 years ago. I know that now when I get on the bike, I am in better shape than I was three or four or five years ago. When I go swimming, I can swim for much longer than I was able to swim before. And I see the test results that I get from my blood and urine samples every time I go to see my doctor. And as, as I said, I try to do that at least every six months. 
And so it's the scientific method. You get to do something, you try it, you see the results, and then you readjust until you get it right. Thanks for that insight. As I mentioned, this is a change that I've been considering for a while, and I'll certainly take your experiences into account. At least on the ethical and environmental side of things, there's a lot of potential in lab-grown meat, and that's an area that I am watching closely. Unfortunately, at this point, many of the methods still require the use of an animal serum, which would make it non-vegan. But moving on from that, one of your blog posts and podcast episodes was your version of a transhumanist manifesto, which you say is a work in progress and subject to change. While I know you write a lot about the singularity specifically and transhumanism in general, I'd love to find out if you actually identify as a transhumanist. You see, I've evolved. Part of my journey was that when I started, I very much considered myself as both singularitarian and transhumanist, which is why my show was called Singularity One on One and then Singularity FM, which kind of I regretted at times, to be honest. Because first, my interests are much wider than the singularity. And secondly, as time has gone forward, my perspectives and my ideas on both the singularity and transhumanism have evolved. And so uh, now I'd rather call myself as a sort of a curious person on a journey examining those topics rather than label myself as a transhumanist and singularitarian because those have also very kind of ideological or even religious connotations and parts of them which I really want to dissociate myself from. So it sounds like your views have evolved quite a bit from when you started this based on some of the conversations that you've had. What do you see as some of the most pressing issues that we're facing now that you've kind of gleaned from these years of conversations you've had? What are you most looking forward to or concerned about in the next few years? Well, to be honest, I'm I'm still most concerned about things like old old school things like nuclear war. You know, I grew up, as I said, in communist Bulgaria. And at the time when I was a child, especially when I was like six or seven years old in like 82 or 83, you know, we were all worried about nuclear war. Uh, And luckily at that time is when we started Perestroika and we had uh, the Non-Nuclear Proliferation Treaty and the treaties uh, with between uh, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev and the situation started getting better and better all the time. But, you know, then after the collapse of the Cold War, we kind of almost forgot about that issue. But the reality is we still have tens of thousands of nuclear weapons today in the world. And we have the capacity to destroy ourselves and our planet and most, if not all, life on our planet several times over with all those weapons, by the way. And look at the current geopolitical situation, and I would think it's hard to say that the relationship between Russia and the rest of the world has not been at such a low level or such a polarized diametrically opposed uh, confrontational even if you want reality since the cold war and then put on top of that the fact that you have a former spy slash kgb operative right who was basically brought up in this kind of real politic dagger kind of a school intellectually speaking because You know, this is what Putin was. He was a former KGB operative in in Eastern Germany, which is why he speaks perfect German, and which is where he observed the collapse of Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc from, Eastern Germany, by the way, who is now trying to kind of go back in time by a a century or so to the uh, pre-revolutionary era and sort of restore the, the former glory of Tsarist Russia as one of the main empires in the world. So you have this kind of person in charge of all Russian nuclear weapons. And then on the other side, you have someone like Donald Trump, who, as one of my latest guests on my show said, I think very well, is a little unhinged. I think that's actually a very good word, (laughs) unfortunately. 
in other words, anything is possible with that kind of guy. And these two gentlemen, if they deserve that term at all, are in charge of 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world right now. So I don't feel reassured that, you know, nuclear war is an impossibility. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that it's a much higher probability than it was like three or four years ago, for example, right? And as a reflection of that, nuclear scientists turned the, the clock to about, I think, maybe two minutes to midnight or something like that, which is basically almost like doomsday scenario, right? Because, I mean, and of course, Putin went on to boost about those incredible, invincible, super fast, you know, undefeatable new missiles that Russia has now and put this cartoon where the missiles are landing in, in I think, in Florida or something like that in the United States. <laughs> so, I mean, that surely doesn't say that we live in a very safe world. So that's to me right now, specifically the most pressing issue is how do we take down the fever, the political fever, the political confrontation that we have from major powers like Russia and um, the United States, but even Russia and the West. And I mean, using nerve agents to kill former spies in the United Kingdom now doesn't help to say the least. Then you have other countries like India and Pakistan, both nuclear capable. Then you have another madman in North Korea. Then you have, of course, Israel, which is a nuclear power in its own right. Then you have France in the United Kingdom and so on. So, and of course, China, which is taking its proper place in the world currently, uh, but it's also a very major nuclear power. And so this is a major issue that we, we have to confront and we have to constantly be aware of because a mistake alongside in that realm can be the end of us or at least take us hundreds of years back in time. Yeah, that's actually one of the only things that I could see that could keep humanity from reaching some kind of exponential technological takeoff. Either civilization is wiped out or we continue to advance. I think it's going to be one of those two options. And this is a very dangerous time for humanity. We're not sure how many civilizations, if any, came before us in our galaxy. But we do know that we aren't finding widespread signs of life, which is concerning. Could the reason for this be that these civilizations inevitably came to a great filter, like nuclear weapons perhaps, that ultimately led to their destruction? That's a major concern that I have. Absolutely, that's the so-called singularity filter that you're talking about. And of course, this is a very strong possibility. And, you know, this can happen overnight. And if you study the history of potential or actual nuclear accidents that we have had in the past, you would see a number of cases and situations where we were one hair away from nuclear annihilation and it was prevented basically because we had good, brave people in a certain situation where, where they absolutely did not follow orders and that basically saved us or we were basically lucky alternatively. So the fact that we have survived so far is not because we're so smart or so skilled, it's because honestly we were lucky so far. We just were lucky. Now, another major issue that I'm very concerned about is of course global warming. And the reason for that is that global warming is going to hit the economies of a number of countries really bad. And when you have that kind of a economic collapse, then political opportunists use the situation to push forward their own agenda. And quite often they get to power. And then in turn, this kind of situation around the globe can create an explosive situation which can push us back to confrontation, whether nuclear or classic uh, confrontation and so on. I often like to say that, you know, People ask me whether um, my greatest fear is artificial intelligence going evil and killing us all like in the Terminator movies. But to me, the, the thing that I fear most is human stupidity. Because I think it is pretty clear that humans are the most dangerous species on our planet. 
It's a fact that we have already proven that with respect to all other species, many of whom we have either pushed to go extinct or we are pushing extinct. So it's clear we are the most dangerous towards them. It's clear we are the most dangerous towards the climate. And I think it is also clear that we are the most dangerous towards each other with nuclear weapons or even without nuclear weapons. And so I think uh, we should beware our own uh, stupidity and uh, not shy away from our own responsibility because we are now the givers and takers of life and we have the power in our hands to either destroy the world or to save ourselves and the rest of the species. So I don't think we need to wait for an artificial intelligence to, to save us from ourselves. And if they do, and if we do, then this may not look like what we hope for, by the way. So we'd better take our responsibility and show that we can survive this and shoulder the responsibility on our own while we still have that opportunity. Well, I think that is a great place to wrap up this episode. But one quick note about the AI. The one thought that I have on that is most of our technology is fine if we use it in benevolent ways. If the user has good intentions, it works out. But now we're quickly getting to a point with our computer capabilities and especially with AI that a completely benevolent user could still use it in a way that has unintended consequences. I know the paperclip maximizer is a good example of this. I mean, telling an AI to maximize human flourishing could have completely unintended consequences. And that's a risk that I am very concerned about. So it's not only good intentions that we need, it's well thought out right. plans of ownership and stewardship of these technologies, which is definitely another conversation to have at a different time. I had so many things I wanted to talk to you about and we only got through a <laughs> few of them, but this was an interesting conversation. And for anyone who wants to learn more, I would definitely suggest that they go check out your podcast and your blog for additional information you've interviewed some of the biggest names in this space whether it's in robotics or ai or futurism in general and i think they're definitely worth checking out so do you have any parting messages for my audience before we go the parting messages are probably in the articles that i referred before which is to say number one technology is amoral what we do with it makes it either moral or immoral so te technology in its own right is never enough. It's what we do with it that makes the difference. And then number two is consider that technology as a tool is merely the how. It is not the why and it's not the what. So before we start obsessing and worshiping technology in its own right, we should put it in its proper place. That is just a means to an end. It's never an end in itself. And so instead of focusing on the how, we should rather focus on why and what. Why do we want to use technology and what do we want to accomplish, right? So if we get the how right, which is to say the technology, but if we screw up the why and the what, we're still going to end up either killing ourselves or not getting any better and probably worse, right? So we, we must get the why and the what right before we get to the how. Otherwise, we have no chance of survival. Yes, those are very important things that we all need to be thinking about, whether we're directly hands-on creating this technology or just having the conversation surrounding it. Uh, I want to thank you for bringing those points up and make sure that everyone keeps those in mind. So thank you again for joining me on the Future Grind podcast. I greatly appreciated it. My pleasure, Ryan. You did a great job. Ask great questions. You have done your research very well. And uh, I foresee great, uh, great future for your podcast if you stick to it. So keep up the good work, man. Hey, everyone. Ryan O'Shea again. And thanks for listening to my interview with Nicola. Once again, we remind you that the thoughts of the guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Future Grind or myself. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe. You can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Future Grind.